Hello, my name is Carissa, and today I'm presenting model comparison with Bayes factors. Um, and this is a project I worked on with my colleague Chu Wei Lin. So today I will go over what Bayes factors are. Um, I will go over how to interpret Bayes factors, followed by some advantages and disadvantages of using Bayes factors in practice. And then I will run through two examples in the binomial model and one example with the normal model. So to get started, let's start with Bayes' theorem. On the left-hand side of the equation, we have our posterior, which is equivalent to the probability of our model given the observed data. Where in this case, the subscript K denotes the model set, where we have um, model one and model two. So let's pretend this is model one. Then the probability of model one given the data would be equivalent to the prior probability of model one um, multiplied by the likelihood, which is the probability of observing the data that we did given model one. And then we divide that by the probability of the data. And so furthermore, since we denoted our model set, our denominator would actually be equal to all possible cases where it's equivalent to the probability of the data given model one times the prior probability of model one plus the probability of the data given model two times the prior of model two. And this is further explained in Cass and Raftery, 1995. So check that out if this is confusing. So from there, since uh, now that we've expanded this denominator, we can see that the denominator would be equivalent when we're looking at model one or model two. And so therefore we can take the direct ratio of the two models such that our posterior odds are now equal to our prior odds multiplied by the Bayes factor, which is also the ratio of the marginal likelihoods. So in this case, the prior odds are being updated by the Bayes factor to get the posterior. And we can also compute the Bayes factor as being the posterior odds divided by the prior odds. Note that when the prior odds are equal to one, then the base factor is equivalent to the posterior odds. So now let's further break down the base factor. So as I mentioned before, the base factor is the ratio of the marginal likelihoods of the two models. So we could expand this, which is essentially what we're doing to get this piece is we're taking the integral of the probability of the data given the parameters under model one multiplied by the probability of theta given model one, d theta. And we can do that on the denominator as well, where in this case, x is our data. Again, m1 is model one, m2 is model two, and theta are the parameters. We are interested in the same parameters within both models. So this first piece right here is the likelihood. Again, the probability of the data given theta or the parameters under model one, and the second piece right here is the prior or the prior probability of beta given model one. And by integrating this, again, we can get our marginal likelihood. To interpret the base factor, in this case, we have a base factor one, two, where one represents the model in the numerator and two represents the model in the denominator. Um, hypothetically, if we get a value of five by dividing these two marginal likelihoods, then we would say that the data are five times in favor of model one relative to model two. And if we flip the models so that now we have model two in the numerator and model one in the denominator, we get a base factor of two one, which means that now the data are one over five times in favor of model two relative to model one. So by changing the model in the numerator and the model in the denominator, these values are inverses of each other. Uh, and you can use any number. So in this case, I use model one, model two. Oftentimes people will use zero to refer to the null hypothesis and one to refer to the alternative hypothesis. So as I mentioned before, they are inverses. So let's check out a classification scheme. The original classification scheme of base factors was developed by Jeffries, 1961. And it was later modified by uh, several researchers such as Lee and Wagenmakers. So in this classification scheme, a base factor of one, zero of one to three would be considered anecdotal evidence. 
3 to 10 would be considered moderate, 10 to 30 strong, 30 to 100 very strong, and over 100 would be extreme. And again, our, if we flip these two numbers, we get the inverse. So a base factor 1, 0 of 3 is equivalent to a base factor 0, 1 of 1 over 3. And if we wanted to put them on the common scale, we can simply take the log of the Bayes factor. So this is important because we get the same number no matter which model is in the numerator or the denominator. The only thing that changes is the sign. So we'll get a positive number if the model in the numerator has more evidence, and we'll get a negative number if the model in the denominator has more evidence. And so we can interpret, for example, 1.10 as suggesting evidence in favor of the one meaning alternative of the alternative model, whereas if we add a log of the base factor 1, 0, negative 1 1.10, that would suggest that we have evidence in favor of our null model. So what are some advantages of base factors? First, we can accumulate evidence to support the null hypothesis of no difference. And this is important because it comes in contrast to frequentist null hypothesis significance testing where p-values simply cannot accumulate evidence to support the null hypothesis. One can either reject the null hypothesis or fail to reject the null hypothesis, but we can never accept the null hypothesis. So this is an advantage of base factors because we can accumulate evidence in either direction. With that being said, we can also compare any two models. So if we have two hypotheses that we're interested in, we can look at the evidence in support of either model relative to the other model to see which model potentially is better supported by the data. We can also compute base factors on non-nested data. So in the what I walked through earlier, I showed that we used the same parameter set when we integrated over the parameter space. However, we could have used two different parameter sets to look at the two different models. So we can compute two marginal likelihoods with the same parameter set. It could be with two different parameter sets and we can still compare and compute the base factor. And then finally, base factors are useful for variable selection. So for example, in the context of regression, base factors can be useful for selecting which variable should be included in the model and which should not. So what are some disadvantages of base factors? First, they can be difficult to compute with complex models or with multi-dimensional models. So when models become increasingly complex, we cannot simply take the integral and instead we need to use MCMC sampling or other approximation methods. Second, base factors may not be the best method of comparison depending on use. So for example, when the number of comparisons is very large, we're not just comparing two models, we're comparing 50. It simply becomes impractical to compute the base factor between every possible model comparison. And so in this case, it's uh, potentially more practical to use a asymptotic method such as the BIC. And then finally, base factors are sensitive to non-informative priors. So for example, using a uniform prior can actually, typically uniform priors are assumed to be non-informative and not be influencing our data analysis. But however, when we're doing base factors, Using an, a uniform prior over the probability of theta given the model can actually have a consequence of putting increased weight on the null model. So we have to be very careful in our prior selection to ensure that we're not potentially favoring one model over the other when we do not mean to. So now I'm going to run through a binomial model example to compute the base factor. So let's pretend we're interested in comparing the number of times that a coin lands on heads versus tails. Our null uh, hypothesis is that the number of times the coin lands on heads will be equal to the number of times it lands on tails. We could represent this with a prior of theta given our null model being equivalent to 50%. And then our alternative hypothesis is that the number of times the coin lands on heads will not be equal to that of tails. And in this case, we're going to uh, represent the prior probability as a beta 1, 1 distribution or a uniform distribution. Up here, we have the probability mass function for a binomial distribution, which has the parameters n, meaning the number of trials, x, the number of successes, and theta, the probability of success. And then we'll also be using a conjugate prior, which in this case is the beta distribution, which has the hyperparameters of alpha and beta. 
So hypothetically, let's pretend that we observed 53 heads out of 100 coin flips. So now we can solve for our marginal likelihoods. So for our null hypothesis, our prior is just 50%. So we can plug in that value for theta. And we're solving again for the probability of observing 53 heads given theta under the null hypothesis. And we get a value of 0 0.07. And this piece should look familiar. So again, this is just our probability mass function for a binomial model. Moving down here, we now have to integrate because we are looking at a uniform distribution. Because a uniform distribution is proportional to one, it is included in this model implicitly. And so by solving, we get 0 0.0099. So we can interpret this to mean that the data are 7.07 times in favor of the null hypothesis relative to the alternative hypothesis, and this is considered moderate evidence. So now we plotted the number of successes or the times that the coin lands on heads by the log of the Bayes factor, and keep in mind that we fixed the hyperparameters and just we're just varying um, the number of successes in this case. So what we observed was right about here, 53 successes, which give us a base factor 0, 01 of 7.07. .07. If we had gotten 50 successes, we would have a log base factor of about negative 2.08, which actually is um, moderate evidence in support of the null model. But as the number of successes increases and decreases, we accumulate a lot of support for the alternative model. And the alternative model is that the number of times that the coin lands on heads is not equal to that of tails. So that is uh, what we should expect. And furthermore, just to kind of show the amount of evidence, anything above this line would be considered extreme evidence in support of the alternative model. So now we can do this again, but let's instead say that we're interested in determining if the coin is fair versus if the coin is biased. So if the coin is fair, we're going to speculate that the distribution will be centered at 50%. And we represent this with the prior over uh, the probability of theta given the alternative model as a beta 5 5 distribution. And then our second model that we're interested in is let's say the coin is biased in terms of heads. And we believe that the coin would land on heads more often than it lands on tails, let's say three fourths of the time. And we represent this with a prior over theta given model two as a beta 12, four distribution, which has a mean at 75%. So this is an example of what the two priors look like. So the prior over model one that the coin is fair is centered at 50%. And then the prior over our model that the coin is biased has a mean of 75%. Okay, so now we can write out our marginal likelihoods for both of our hypotheses. As before, we have our probability mass function for our binomial distribution. And here we have our probability function for our beta distribution. And I went ahead and plugged in the hyperparameter values for alpha and beta um, into the function here. And so we could go ahead and solve for a marginal likelihood. For hypothesis one, we get 0 0.023. For hypothesis two, we get 0 0.006. And so solving for the Bayes factor one, two, we divide these two values to get a value of 3.83. And we can interpret this to mean that the data are 3.83 times in favor of hypothesis one relative to hypothesis two, and this would be considered moderate evidence. And this blue line here represents the Bayes factors, and on the x-axis we have the number of successes. So as successes increase, we gain support for model two, that the coin is biased towards heads, and then as the number of successes decrease, we gain support for model one such that any values below this thick red line or above this thick red line are considered strong evidence in support of model two and model one respectively. And anything above this dashed red line is considered extreme evidence. So now we're gonna move on to the normal model example. In this case, we're using real data available on Kaggle. This data set contains student final grades. And so let's suppose that our first models that mean Final course grades do not differ between the male and female students. And let's suppose hypothetically that in a previous year, 
female students scored 20% better than male students. This hypothetical scenario, we could represent this prior knowledge in our prior and say in model two, we would expect mean final course scores to be 20% higher for females. So in the first example, we could represent our prior with a standard normal distribution with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, where zero represents the mean difference between male and female student final course scores. And then this uh, second example in hypothesis two, we would have a normal distribution with a mean of 0.2 and a standard deviation of one. So something to note is that we're fixing the variance in both models because we don't have a reason to believe that there would be a different variance across both of the hypotheses, but we do vary the mean and the mean is represented by the mean difference. So um, again, this is a parameterization of a normal model. The parameters of mu, which is the mean and sigma squared, which is the variance. And so to get the marginal likelihood, in this case, if we have a both a likelihood and a prior our normal distributions, we could represent it as follows. Where again, we're representing sigma squared of uh, group one, group two being male and female. Again, X is the final grade data and alpha is the mean difference in final grades between males and females. So we log transform the student final grades just to put them on a continuous scale. And so as we can see here, this is the female grades. This is the male grades where on the y-axis, we just have the density. So now we could actually go through and compute the marginal likelihood. So we just plug in the values as we have in the previous examples. And we take the ratio of the two marginal likelihoods with a base factor of one, two being equivalent to about one. And a base factor of one is considered anecdotal evidence. And thus we do not have enough evidence to truly support either one of the models. And so if we fix the hyperparameters and plot the log of the base factor as we have before, we would see that anything below this uh, run line would be considered extreme evidence in support of model two. We don't really ever gain a lot of support for model one, but either way, yes, yeah, the prior mean difference gets larger or smaller, we accumulate evidence. Here are some great resources to check out. Thank you so much.